Thanks, Taylor. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, everyone at Claire Booth Luce for inviting me to speak. I love speaking to uh, groups such as this of wonderful, smart, dedicated, brave, conservative women. It is inspiring to see you all here, to know that you're here in Washington, and to um, give you hopefully some advice and help and maybe a little ammunition as you go back to your college campuses or continue in your careers. Um, as you heard, I'm uh, the president and publisher of Regnery Publishing. We are the leading publisher of conservative books in the country. We have been so for 70 years. We celebrated our 70th anniversary uh, last fall. And um, we were started in Chicago, 1947, by a man named Henry Regnery, hence the name. And um, throughout the history of the company, we've been dedicated to conservative ideals, conservative authors, conservative books. Um, at the very early years of Regnery Publishing's history, we published some of the most influential books in the modern conservative movement. Um, books like God and Man at Yale by William F. Buckley, um, uh, Whitaker Chambers' Witness, uh, The Conservative Mind by Russell Kirk. Um, these are some of the seminal books in the modern conservative movement. They're all still in print today. We have kept them in print for uh, 50 years or more. And um, they were sort of the bedrock of what, uh, how we grew our list and our brand as the um, sort of go-to publisher for conservative authors and ideas. Um, has continued throughout our, uh, our history and certainly in the 20 years that I have been at Regnery, we've continued that commitment to conservative ideas. And um, we also have uh, gained a reputation for publishing a lot of bestsellers. We've had 80 books on the uh, bestseller list in the past 20 years. Um, 13 or 14 of those have hit number one on the list. And um, they are written by, we have published, frankly, most of the leading conservative authors that you know. Ann Coulter, Newt Gingrich, Michelle Malkin, David Limbaugh, Dinesh D'Souza, Mark Levin, Mark Stein, um, Donald Trump, um, true, Sebastian Gorka. Um, the list is, uh, is quite long and impressive. And um, it's given me a chance to work with a lot of the leading thinkers in the conservative movement um, in the past uh, 20 years as well. And I think the thing that unites all of those authors is this commitment not just to conservative ideals, but to the ideals that um, the, this country was based on, which I actually think those two things are synonymous. Um, and uh, really, I've had the privilege of working with them as publisher, which um, is a sort of unique opportunity to do a number of things, because uh, really the job of a publisher is, um, in, my, in my estimation, probably four important things that a publisher does, a book publisher does. First, we give voice to authors. Um, sometimes people have asked me, especially recently, oh my gosh, are you worried that as a publisher you're going to go out of business because books aren't in print anymore, everybody's reading ebooks? And so I then explain the difference between a publisher and a printer. If I were a printer, I might be nervous. But a publisher's job, right, is to be the connector between the author and the reader and to figure out how to help the author say, what they want to say in the best, most powerful, most persuasive way possible, and then how to make sure those ideas and that author uh, connects with their readers through bookstores, through media, through book signings and speeches and events. And so it's that job of connecting authors and readers together that um, makes publishers um, have, that, that is an important role for a publisher. I think it's also our job to explore and explain ideas. Um, when you think about our, you know, what our service that we provide for readers, that's that's really what it is. We explore ideas and we explain ideas, and um, sound bites and tweets get attention, 
and that's important and we use those things to get attention but there are many many things that cannot be explored or explained in you know 145 is it more than that now characters um but in a short soundbite in a tweet uh in a post or even in a, a magazine article or a or a, a newspaper article so um the the exploration and explanation of ideas is uniquely addressed in books and that's what publishers do um I think there are also a couple other things that good publishers do that we try to do. Um, One of those is we love to spark a debate. Some people might say we love to start a fight, but I think we like to get people talking. We like to get people discussing those ideas. It's not just enough as a publisher to lay out an idea and present it and people you know don't have a reaction if you're really doing a good job as a publisher you're getting people to debate ideas they understand a point of view and then they take the opposite point of view or they strengthen their own point of view so I often uh, I often talk to uh, I talk to a lot of people who want to be authors and um, sometimes an author, a, a wannabe author, will say to me, well, I, I want to present a book that's completely objective. Um, my opinion is that there's no such thing. Once you write, you are coming from a point of view. Writing is subjective by definition because it comes from a person. Um, and I have a lot more respect, frankly, for authors and writers who own their point of view, who are candid and honest about what their point of view is, where they're coming from. Um, It's not the same thing as saying I don't want authors to back up their arguments with facts and data and good sound arguments, Um, but I'd much rather publish an author with a strong point of view um, than someone who's trying to show um, how objective he or she is. Um, And then, honestly, the last and possibly most important job of a publisher, in my opinion, is to make the world a better place. Sounds lofty, but honestly, as a publisher, I think that if you don't think part of your job is to make the world a better place, um, you won't enjoy it as much, you won't be as successful, and your books don't have staying power. So, I mean, there are many ways to make the world a better place, including entertainment. If you write humor books, that makes the world a better place because people are laughing and that makes them happy. So um, it doesn't have to be life-changing, world-changing messages, although sometimes um, that is what we do and um, and that can make the world a better place too. But um, the reverse is also true. Um, sort of the Hippocratic Oath of publishers, is to make sure that your books are not making the world a worse place, which I could probably, probably shouldn't name some of the publishers and books that I think have done that. Um, So to be a good publisher, to be um, a good current events political publisher, as as Regnery is, um, we have to be news junkies and we have to be trend watchers. And so um, today, what I want to talk to you about um, is not the world of book publishing or the life of a book publisher, but I'm going to talk to you about an idea. And this, uh, this idea is um, not a new idea, but it's under attack. And um, one of the most disturbing trends that I see as I watch trends in the culture and in the news um, is uh, is threatening and frankly undermining this idea. Um, I'll, there are actually a few related trends in today's culture that I think are particularly worrisome to me as a publisher and as an American. Um, one of them is a trend that I think you'll recognize in which I believe tolerance has morphed into forced endorsement. And what I mean by that is um, 10, 15, 20 years ago, we were asked, if you don't agree with an idea, that's okay, live and let live. That Everyone has the right to their own idea, and so you should be respectful of those ideas. And I do think we should res- be respectful of ideas that we disagree with. What I don't... Um, what I worry about in today's culture is that it's not enough for a lot of people on the left 
that we tolerate ideas um, that we disagree with. Um, we are asked, if not required, to agree with those ideas, to endorse those ideas. You may have heard uh, the story about a young woman who was on the U.S. women's soccer team who was told that if she wanted to play on the soccer team, she had to wear a gay pride t-shirt. She didn't agree with that agenda, but it wasn't enough that she would play on the team and people who agreed with that would wear the t-shirt and she wouldn't. No, she had to wear the t-shirt if she wanted to play on the team. That's a problem for me because whatever the idea, I think it is counter to um, what it means to be an American to be told you have to agree with someone else's idea. Um, related trend that I worry about is the trend of um, the change from the melting pot, the great melting pot of America being replaced by identity politics so that we are more and more asked and presented with the proposition that people are their identity in a very divisive sort of way. You are defined by your ethnicity, your gender, your race, your religion, um, as opposed to being defined as American and everyone coming together with this great melting pot, this great um, stew that is America made up of many different shapes and colors and races and ethnicities and languages, but ultimately becoming American. Um, and the third trend related to all of this, and I'm sure you have experienced this perhaps the most, is the um, shouting down of free speech by progressives who label anything they disagree with as hate speech. Um, I think it is very dangerous. I believe this as a publisher and as an American. I think it's very dangerous for um, ideas, again, that we disagree with, that we find objectionable, that we find hateful, to be silenced. Because only when we hear ideas that we disagree with can we strengthen our own opinions and our own arguments against them. Um, so all of these trends are, to me, come under the heading of um, sort of disintegration of America, divisiveness, right? And we hear about this all the time, this sort of divisive tone in the media and the divisiveness in the country. Um, and I think this, to me, this raises the obvious question, okay, well, what binds us together as a country? What, what can we agree on? What, what makes us American? And so for that reason, my biggest concern is this, um, what I'm going to call history shaming that's going on right now. It's going on all over the country, college campuses and, and town squares across the country, where basically anytime someone defends a founding father, someone defends um, American ideals and values and virtue from our past, um, the left immediately throws up a firestorm of um, about misogyny and bigotry and racism and, and oppression. And I feel a lot of times, I know a lot of times you, like, like I, feel sort of backed into a corner, asked to either apologize for the past or just stay silent. Um, and so my message to you today, as is captured in the title of my speech, is that when anyone attacks the Founding Fathers, when anyone denies the greatness of America, when someone insists that we're not a force for good in the world, when someone mocks the idea of American exceptionalism, I say don't apologize, evangelize. Become a champion for American ideals, for what it means to be an American, for what American exceptionalism actually is. So, of course, then you have to know what it is before you can defend it. And so I'm going to try to give you a few arguments, a few ideas that you might be able to use when you hear these kinds of attacks and you're not really sure what to say. Because the attacks can be very clever. and um, and very hard to respond to. 
So let me talk about those for a moment. And first of all, I should lay out a few caveats. Um, I do not mean to say that we are perfect. That's a, that's a common um, false argument against American exceptional. Well, we're not perfect, so we can't be exceptional. Um, certainly, that's, that's an easy one. We're, you know, we're human. We're flawed. Um, as it says in, in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Um, but don't let that be the stopper when someone says, well, obviously, we're not exceptional. We've done things as a country and as individuals that we are not proud of. Um, that is not an argument against American exceptionalism. Um, and we're certainly not superior just by virtue of being born here. Um, when I talk about American exceptionalism, sometimes I get that, well, I mean, just because we were born here doesn't make us better. Um, I don't think we're better. I think we're more lucky. Um, and so I encourage you to become a champion of American values, become a missionary for American values, and become an expert in explaining what American exceptionalism is. Um, and I'm going to tell you what it is. But first, I'm, I think we have to be ready for the attacks, for the criticisms. Because, um, as I said, they're very clever, they're very powerful, and they sometimes sound right, and it's hard to, to respond to, um, to those kinds of challenges when you hear them. Um, and so uh, there are, they fall into two kind of camps. One is, um, I think a lot of people define, misdefine American exceptionalism as when they really just mean unique character of America. What's the unique character of America as a country? Um, everyone from Alexis de Tocqueville to Joseph Stalin, yes, has talked about American exceptionalism. And in all of those cases, I actually believe what they're really talking about is not what makes us exceptional. They're just talking about American people and how they're kind of unique. And so you'll hear about things like um, the frontier spirit. And people talk about sort of the cowboy persona of Americans. Um, sometimes it's, we're compared to Australians. You know, we're not the sort of prim and proper British. We're the wild and crazy, um, adventuresome, um, brave, uh, frontier and cowboy kind of um, conquerors and pioneers. And Sometimes you'll hear about the melting pot. Again, America is this great melting pot. Isn't it amazing that you're, um, you can be an American not just because of your ethnicity, but because you know, you're, you're born here or you come, choose to come here and everybody is included, everybody is welcome. Um, sometimes, this was one of the things that de Tocqueville talked about a lot, was the unique opportunity for upward mobility how we're not a caste system, right? We're not a class system. We don't have an aristocracy. And so it's really easy for no matter what um, social strata you were born in, you can, you can raise up the sort of American dream story. Um, and probably more recently, people talk about our, um, our role in spreading democracy around the world, right? And that is the definition. Um, people hold out for American exceptionalism. And so I want to be clear about this because I think this might help you. None of those things is the definition of American exceptionalism. All of those things are the result of American exceptionalism. All of those things are produced, are, the, uh, are generated by American exceptionalism. We are those things because we are exceptional, not the other way around. Um, harder to fight, I think, and worse, are some of the criticisms of American exceptionalism where they define American exceptionalism as something bad and then attack it. That's a great trick that lawyers love. Um, so here are a few false definitions, I think. These aren't mistakes. These are, in my opinion, intentionally false definitions of American exceptionalism meant to demonize. Um, 
One of them is, um, well, every country thinks it's exceptional, right? Barack Obama very famously had this quote where he said, I believe in American, except I believe in American exceptionalism, he said, just as I suspect the Brits believe in British exceptionalism and the Greeks believe in Greek exceptionalism. And to me, the fundamental flaw with this is that exceptionalism isn't civic pride. It's not patriotism. It's not even love of country. I love America because it's exceptional. It's not exceptional because I love it. Um, and not all things are equally lovable because they're loved. We've all had friends who have had terrible boyfriends. The love might be equal, but the boyfriends were not. So you can't just say, you know, exceptionalism means we love our country. That's not what it is. That's not the definition of exceptionalism. A related criticism is that American exceptionalism is just sort of arrogance. It's a code for morally superior. It's the we think we're so great argument, right? And of course, in a world of moral relativism, there is no such thing as morally superior. So they cut that argument right out at, um, at the outset. But it's, so it's politically correct to mock the idea that um, America may be great. But that doesn't really mean that America isn't great. Um, so we have to, again, ask the question, what is it? that makes America great, and not skip all the way to, well, you're just proud of America, so you're obviously you know, a, uh, a nationalist and, and arrogant, and, uh, and that is the reason to criticize or even reject the concept of exceptionalism. Um, there are two criticisms I love to put together, because you'll see why in a second, they're funny. Um, they go hand in hand. I've heard both the criticism that America cannot be an exceptional country because it's too powerful and it bullies everyone else around the world. It's just sort of the, you know, carries a big stick. And then you also hear the criticism that America can't be exceptional because our power is actually waning and we're not as powerful as we should be. And so we can't do some of the things that we used to be able to do. So you know, aside from the fact that that's ridiculous, you cannot possibly be both, um, both can't be valid arguments. Um, in my opinion, neither one of those is a valid argument um, because again, they entirely miss the point. Our influence around the world is the result of our exceptionalism. It's not the exceptionalism itself. Um, another false argument that you may hear is um, that American exceptionalism is just an excuse to, in, um, to inflate our global, rule, our global role. It's an excuse for us to go out and say, well, we should be in charge or we should, we should help um, you know, spread democracy to other places. Um, here's a quote I love. Um, the United States is not an exceptional nation and is not entitled by virtue of history to play a role on the stage that's different, on the world stage, different from other nations. And again, I think this massively misses the point. I don't think our founders thought we were entitled to play a special role. If anything, they might have thought we were obliged to play a special role, that we had a responsibility to play a role, a role for good. There's a, uh, a leftist theologian who described American exceptionalism as, quote, the automatic assumption that America acts for the right. Again, if you, if you define it that way, it's easy to criticize. Um, but it's easy to disagree with that. But I don't think America always acts for the right. I don't think that's what um, people who defend American exceptionalism think because that's not what American exceptionalism is. All right, so I've told you all the arguments that people throw out to um, try to denigrate American exceptionalism, to try to um, undermine us as a country and, and our, um, our unique 
role, and also the, the threats and the, the criticism of American exceptionalism, the danger of, of undermining that, that thesis is um, to try to disable us from helping other countries, from, help, from being a symbol, from, be, from being a, a beacon of light, from being the things that um, Thomas Jefferson and Abraham Lincoln and Ronald Reagan understood. Um, and I think if you, if you go back in history, those three presidents probably understood best, in my opinion, what American exceptionalism really is. So now I'll tell you what it is. Um, and, and when it comes down to it, um, I urge you to think through how simple this really is. Um, as I said, we're not superior human beings because we were born here. Um, in fact, it's not the individuals who are exceptional. It's the ideals on which our country was founded that make us, that, that make this country exceptional, that are exceptional, and only to the extent that we embody those ideals can we be an exceptional nation. I think, um, so I'm going to read you two things because, of course, I'm a book publisher, so I'm going to read you something. Um, first, um, there are two places that I think best capture this for me. First is, um, not surprisingly, the Declaration of Independence. Because I think there's one clause in the Declaration of Independence that is the foundation, is the answer to what is American exceptionalism. And that is uh, what Thomas Jefferson said in a unique and revolutionary proposition when he said we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, we've all heard those words a lot. We've heard those before. And they, you, you can sort of become um, inured to those words because they're so familiar. But the fact is, when he wrote them and when our country was founded, that was revolutionary. Never before was there, had there been a country that was founded on the ideal that your rights come from God, not other men. And that's it. That's the, that's the linchpin. That's it. If your rights come from God, then no man can take them away. No government, no matter how powerful, no matter how big, no matter how small, no matter how much you like it, no matter how much you agree with them, no government, no group of men can take away the rights the natural rights that you as a human being have. And in fact, not only the rights you have, but the rights every single human being has because we were created equal by our creator. That's it, that's American exceptionalism. That we have rights that do not come from other men and therefore men, ty tyrants, cannot take them away. Um, many authors have written about this concept. Many regnery authors have written about this concept. I'm going to read you um, what I think is one of the best um, uh, examples of kind of unpacking that concept and hopefully giving you a way, again, to explain, because it might not be all that effective to simply quote the Declaration of Independence, although it's not a bad idea. But, um, but let me tell you um, about a book we published a few years ago with Newt Gingrich. And the book was called A Nation Like No Other. And it was um, specifically written to explain this concept of exceptionalism, which I think is, um, is something even more important today to understand. So here's what he said. It's become fashionable among the liberal elite to downplay, deride, even deny American greatness. The political correctness police insist that America is hated around the world for being too big, too powerful, too rich, too successful, too loud, too intrusive. And besides, it's not nice to brag. They are completely missing the point. America's greatness America's exceptional greatness 
is not based on the fact that we are the most powerful, most prosperous, and most generous nation anywhere on earth, although we are. Rather, those things are the result of American exceptionalism. American exceptionalism is founded in the simple yet utterly remarkable principles expressed in the Declaration of Independence, as we've heard. Our nation is exceptional because we, unlike any nation before or since, are united by the belief and the promise that no king, no government, no ruling class has the power to infringe upon the rights of the individual. And when such a government attempts to do so, we will reject it vigorously. Sadly, many politicians and leaders today have forgotten our sacred commitment to these principles. American exceptionalism is not about cheerleading for the home team. It's about recognizing and honoring the history-making, world-changing ideals our founding fathers enshrined to make this a nation of the people, by the people, and for the people. And as Lincoln warned, we must rededicate ourselves to those principles, lest our truly exceptional nation perish from this earth, as he said at Gettysburg. Um, so sometimes it's easier to understand a uh, concept like American exceptionalism with a story. So let me share it with you a, um, a story that I think you'll like. Um, in his book, Remember Why You Play, sports columnist and author David Thomas chronicles a season of high school football played by the grapevine faith Christian Lions. At one point during the season, coach Chris Hogan saw an opportunity to teach his team something much more important than how to win a football game. The Lions were preparing to play against Gainesville State, which was a maximum security juvenile detention center, housing for kids who had been convicted of everything from drugs to armed assault and whose parents had long ago disowned them. Every game played by the Gainesville State Tornadoes ended with uniformed officers escorting the players to their bus in groups of five, handcuffs at the ready. Before the game, Coach Hogan sent an email asking his team and their friends and family to do something unusual. He asked for half of the faith Christian fans to switch sides and cheer for the other team by name. When asked by his own team members why he was making this surprising request, Hogan responded, imagine if you didn't have a home life. Imagine if everybody had pretty much given up on you. Now imagine what it would mean for hundreds of people to suddenly believe in you. Well, the Gainesville Tornadoes soon learned. On game night, they entered the field to find a line of faith fans who were cheering for them. Confused at first, the Tornadoes soon realized that hundreds of faith fans and even cheerleaders were not mistakenly cheering for the wrong team. They heard their own names being shouted from the stands. After that, they played better than they had played all season. And even though they still lost, they gave their head coach a sideline Gatorade shower as if they had just won the state championship. More important, they left the field that night forever changed. Following the game, both teams came together to pray. A Gainesville player said, Lord, I don't know how this happened, so I don't know how to say thank you, but I never would have known there were so many people in the world that cared about us. As the Gainesville coach left the field, he grabbed Hogan and he said, you'll never know what your people did for these kids tonight. You'll never, ever know. Coach Hogan described the message he intended to send to the youth of Gainesville State that night. We love you. Jesus Christ loves you. You are just as valuable as any other person on earth. And Newt continues, perhaps the most revolutionary concept enshrined in America's founding and in our declaration was that every life has equal value and worth. 
It is the same ideal that motivated the founders to go to unprecedented lengths to protect religious history. If all men are created equal, then not even the most powerful man, group, or government on earth has the power to trample your rights. If all men are created equal, then all human beings are equally flawed and equally susceptible to the appeal of power and to the inherent temptation to dictate how others should live their life. Thus, the best government is a limited one. If all men are created equal, then every person is equally accountable to God, to his fellow man, to live a life of virtue, productivity, and personal responsibility. Such a life can only be realized in a society in which every person has the freedom to choose between right and wrong. For freedom to endure, it is vital to cultivate the values that make it possible to sustain such freedoms. If all men are created equal, then each and every individual has equal dignity and inherent worth, regardless of his or her station in life, ethnic background, political beliefs, personal achievement, personal failure. And if all men are created equal, then every life is, in fact, as valuable as any other person on planet Earth, whether youths from the Gainesville State Detention Facility or the family of, family of faith Christian fans who cared enough to cheer for someone else's child and to call them by name. So I share that with you because I do think that um, as we talk to people, as we argue, as we defend our beliefs, and as we defend um, American exceptionalism and what it means for us to be exceptional, um, we do it out of a sense not of attack, not of denigration, not of mockery, but of sharing what is an incredible um, ideal, what is a, a very selfless um, principle that our country is based on. It is ironically the opposite of hubris. It is the opposite of feeling that we're better than everyone else. In fact, um, American exceptionalism quite specifically says no one's better than anyone else. No one's born better. Um, we're all equal. We're all born equal and we all make mistakes. And the the ideal of American exceptionalism is that we all have equal opportunity and that there are rights that we have to pursue those opportunities that come from God and therefore no man and no government can ever take away. And I believe that's why um, so many people still today want nothing more than to live in America, to move to America, to leave wherever they are, to leave the comfort and familiarity of their home and their family and the culture and language they know to come here um, because of that very, very unique opportunity and that unique platform that, uh, that undergirds everything we do. So I hope I've given you some ideas on how to um, answer people who uh, try to criticize or mock um, American exceptionalism and the ideals of America. Um, I think it's really important for us to stand up for them and also to uh, remind people that throughout our history, um, both the successes we have and the mistakes we have made are often can be measured by how closely they follow that ideal or how far we stray from that ideal. And it's not a proof that we are not exceptional to point out the mistakes. It is simply evidence that we're not perfect and we always are striving to live up to that higher ideal. Thank you very much. I'll take questions too if anyone has any questions. Any questions about anything? Yes. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Okay. <laughs> um, so these founding principles that you've been talking about, they've gone from being just unique 
to being radical in the eyes <laughs> of today's right. culture. So how can we promote these so-called radical beliefs and help people realize that they're really just what our nation was founded on right. in a tone that they'll accept? Like, you That's know, a great radical. question. And I think, yeah. again, I think part of it can be through stories, like the story I shared. And if we search for other stories where people can sort of emotionally understand the power of treating everyone as equal and also treating everyone as if they have worth that comes from God, um, I think that can be a very powerful answer. I also think that most people don't, I think most people actually like those words in the Constitution, whether or not, I mean in the Declaration, whether or not they actually understand them. I think most people still like those and would say that they agree with them. So I think if you present that and say, no, 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 American exceptionalism is very simple. It's just this concept. It's just this assumption. It's this um, proposition that um, that was radical, and you know, understand that was radical then, because nobody had done it, um, and certainly no nation had been found on that principle. So, but it's just though that simple proposition that is American exceptionalism, because I think one of the ways that people tear down. Um, America as exceptional and great um, and virtuous is by throwing out a lot of these false definitions. And so I think one of the most effective things is to say, no, 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 that, I'm not saying that. And sort of, you're right. That would be silly. That's not exceptional. You're right. Here's what's exceptional. And I think if we hold, hold out something fairly simple, um, it's, I think people have a pretty hard time arguing with that simple proposition. And then it's just a discussion. So what does that mean we should do? What does that mean we should, um, how we should live? What does that mean about this issue that we're talking about right now? Are we living up to that ideal? Or is this a violation of that ideal? Because if you agree with the ideal, then it's really you're just talking tactics. You're talking you know, um, specific application. And, um, and, and the point of talking about it that way also is, the application might be flawed. Absolutely, there are plenty. Again, there are plenty of things we've done incorrectly, um, and and there are plenty of morally flawed decisions that the country and certainly we as individuals have made. Um, but um, but let's go back to what the proposition is. If we agree with that, then let's all then we can agree. Then maybe this is something that brings us together. Because if we all agree on that, maybe then that can inform us on how to move forward and how to talk about it in a more civil way. Sure. Yes. <laughs> Other questions, comments? Yes. Uh, so you touched briefly on how our culture is being more and more like further and further away from moral truth and Yeah. Consent seems to be the basis and things like that. How would you argue many of these um, founding truths from that perspective seem to be because it's hard to convince someone who doesn't believe in moral truth of these things? I agree. I agree. It is. Um, I have this conversation all the time. Um, and I, I think um, there is, again, it's part of a discussion. And sometimes the best way to have that discussion is to find one thing that you can agree on. Do you agree it's wrong, you know, it's morally wrong to murder? Do you, but the other way, and you know, you can get in a discussion with that. Well, it depends, you know, there, you, you can get that answer on, on almost anything. Um, one, one, a different way to approach it that I have found a little bit more successful is to say, um, when you help somebody, who's less fortunate than you? Does that make you feel good? <laughs> does it make you feel good? And most people will say, yes, it does. When I help somebody who's less fortunate, it makes me feel good. Well, why is that good? <laughs> what, what's good? What, what is even the definition of good? And if we can agree that doing something that, that you sort of intuitively, that you don't even, you can't, most people can't even explain to you why they feel good about that, why they feel 
not only feel good, but feel that is the right thing to do, that's, that's the beginning of a conversation. Because I think people a lot of times are, you know, are very um, casual about not exploring their own feelings and their own motivations. And so that starting by asking people, well, you know, do you feel good about, and then, com- you know, an example like that, that can be the beginning of a conversation. Yes. One thing that you said that really stood out to me is talking about how since all people are equal, the government should be limited, and that every person has the freedom to choose from uh, right from wrong. So an issue that I was actually wondering about with your thoughts would be is when you come across issues like abortion or even mm-hmm. human rights and situations like that, what is the government's role in in a way infringing on that freedom to choose between right and wrong? Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's a great question because I don't think we as conservatives have been terribly consistent about that. Um, I think there's definitely an argument that's a sort of more libertarian argument that says the smaller the government, the better. And so government should not have any business being involved in any of those kinds of decisions. Um, I I actually think those those two issues are quite different, though, because um, the it comes back to what is the proper role of government. And I don't think that the founders thought, and I do think American exceptionalism has to be understood as what what did the founders think? What was the proposition on which they built the country? And I, I don't think they thought, they believed in no government. I don't think they believed that there was no proper role for government. And it's very easy to go from, you know, the smaller the better, and so, well, the natural extension of that is, you know, non-existent is the best. Um, I don't. I don't think um, they believed that. So I. I think um, it's actually really instructive to go back to um, the Constitution and look at what did the founders really think the proper role of government was. And certainly one of them was to safeguard citizens. That that's that's a proper role of government to provide safety, security, and you know to ensure that um, a renegade citizen doesn't either take away your rights or physically harm you. And I think abortion could easily be um, understood in that context. Um, I think when you get into um, something like um, gay marriage or all the gender issues, I think that is um, a perfect example of government trying to get involved in something and forcing values on people that they don't agree with, that is not clearly not the role, the proper role of government. And it certainly, um, I, I believe, violates the, the tenet of um, the pursuit of happiness in terms of the government forcing upon you a certain set of ideals or, or values. So. Um, clearly, to me, the founders were, were very uh, adamant that not only sh- on, the, on the subject of religious liberty, they were very clear that r- religious liberty does not mean absence of religion. It means absence of a government-enforced religion, which means two things. It means the government should not um, interfere with the citizens' religious beliefs and practices, as well as should protect us to practice, to have the right to practice our religious beliefs. And I mean, I think that um, however one interprets the Supreme Court decision um, earlier this week on uh, the master's piece, Baker's, um, you know, some some say it was a triumph for religious liberty, some, some say did, they didn't go far enough, and you know it was really because Colorado was was so obnoxious about it. <laughs> they had been nice; it might have been okay. Um, but certainly, I think that the you know the the tenant on which that that decision was based is you cannot force someone um, to violate their own religious beliefs. You cannot dictate that they. You cannot prevent them from practicing their religious beliefs. And so I think there are again. There are places that it's appropriate for the government to go, and I think the founders believe that. I think the, the line is, um, 
you know, are they, is the government, is what the government's doing really sticking to the constitutional role of government as the founders saw it, which is, you know, is pretty limited and it has a few clear roles that the government should legitimately play, including protecting security and safety. But start, when they start to enforce beliefs and values, that's, uh, that's where they've gone too far. And I think that's what, the, um, that's what the founders were worried about because tyranny is when um, you, know, you are forced to act in a way that conflicts with your own uh, moral beliefs. Sure. Other questions, comments? Michelle. <laughs> Pretty great talk. Thank you. Oh, so thank much. you. Let me take you off topic. Of course. <laughs> More time for my mom. She wants to say to me, I have a great idea for a book. <laughs> and I really want to write it. And Marjorie Ross is a publisher. She's on your board. Talk to her or ask her what it is I should do. Sure. Um, yeah, I get that question, of course, all the time. Um, sometimes I don't tell people I'm a publisher when I go to a party because invariably <laughs> someone there has written a book or knows somebody who's written a book. Um, but what I tell uh, most uh, people who are just starting out in their career, if they want to be a, a book author, is... Um, that you're much better off becoming a, an expert in a particular subject than trying to give your opinion. Um, the, I think um, most book buyers are over the age of 40. The vast majority of books are sold to people over 40. People over 40 are not all that interested in the opinions of people under 25. <laughs> um, even at the dinner table, no. Um, so I think that it's it can seem presumptuous for somebody in their 20s to, ra to write a polemical book. Um, however, it's not that hard to be an expert in a subject matter. You know, it's really not, it, most people are not willing to invest the amount of work and time it takes to be an expert in a subject. You can be an expert in some policy subjects and some topics in a year if you really dedicate yourself to learning about it and reading about it and researching it and talking to people. So my advice to uh, young people who want to write um, nonfiction is to just develop an expertise in something you're interested in, whatever it is, and start writing about it all the time. Don't worry about being paid for it. Write. Um, the more times you are published online, in print, um, the more credibility you will have when you go to a book publisher. The book publisher has no idea whether you got paid for that or not. It doesn't matter. Um, all we will know is, look at this. You know, we'll Google you, and we'll see all these bylines of you having written about something. And if you are consistently writing about a particular area, uh, then, again, this will build your credibility as an expert in that area. So, um, so my advice on, on nonfiction is to just, you know, become an expert in something that you find interesting. Uh, maybe it's something you're working on in your day job, um, or maybe it's just a hobby. Um, but um, again, become a subject matter expert, and then you will be, um, you could easily be the go-to person to write the book about it, or a book about it. Um, there are lots of agents and literary agents around who can help you. Um, the single best use of an agent is to match you up with the right publisher, so I will give you the shortcut. Um, if you want to write a book, whatever it is, the easiest way to find an agent, and frankly the easiest way to find a publisher, go into the bookstore, if you can find one, go into the bookstore and go to the section of the store that has books similar to the one you want to write. And Pull those books off the shelf and look in the acknowledgments. And oftentimes those authors will acknowledge their agent, their editor, their publisher, their collaborator, and those are all the people you want to talk to. Not the author, all the people that help them. And then you write to those people and you say, hey, 
I noticed you published Newt Gingrich's book, A Nation Like No Other. Well, I've written a book that I think would appeal to this very same audience as the people who like that book, because. And I think I'm the right person to write this, because. And that is an incredibly powerful way to get the attention of a publisher or an agent or an editor. They already have a knowledge of this. They already decided to publish it, so you know they will. And um, it gives them sort of a shortcut as to how to think about what you, who you are and what you're talking about. And um, it gives you a much higher likelihood that you will get a response. You don't always get a positive response, but it gives you a much higher likelihood of getting a response and also of connecting with somebody who kind of understands and maybe is even an expert in that kind of book and um, and that's um, that's the best way for you to get published other book related book publishing questions no all right thank you very much have a great conference <laughs>